Last time, we looked at how the city of Greater Sudbury was transformed from magnificent old growth forest to barren moonscape in less than 100 years by industrial activities like clear cutting and smelter emissions that made this region almost entirely uninhabitable to plants. But clearly something has changed. 40 years ago, this area where we're standing right now was little more than bare rock. And science tells us that it would have taken hundreds, if not thousands of years for a new forest to grow. But here we are. So let's take a closer look at how this regreening has been made possible. When we left off, I said that change started in the 1960s and 70s to regreen. But what I think should be pretty obvious from that first chapter is that it wasn't going to be easy. There were challenges that needed to be overcome first. One of the biggest challenges was the air. The smelter emissions, the pollution like sulfur dioxide had to be reduced or plants would never have been able to grow. That was the job for the mining companies here in Sudbury, to find a way to do their work more efficiently to reduce waste and keep the air clean. Through innovation and the implementation of new technologies to keep waste out of the sky. One of the first big steps was the construction of the super stack in the early 1970s. The height of this smokestack directs the smoke higher way up off the ground, so it spreads out and causes fewer serious issues for life on the ground. Since then, what is more important is that they've actually learned how to recapture most of the potential pollution, like sulfur dioxide, and to stop it from escaping out into the air. Let's compare the sulfur dioxide, the short form is SO2, emitted from smelters in Sudbury in 1970 and 1980. So I'll remind you that regreening did start in 1978. That's the amount of sulfur dioxide that was released into the air in 1970. And 10 years later, this was the amount in 1980. This change made regreening possible. The quality of the air here in Sudbury improved so much because of this new technology. And it's only gotten better. Today they release even less, less than 90% of what they did in 1970. The next big challenge to regreening was the soil. After decades of pollution and acid rain and erosion, the soil was in no shape to support plants. It was unhealthy, and plants need a healthy soil to grow. So we couldn't just go out there and start planting trees. We had to take care of the soil first. The first step was to add crushed limestone. This crushed limestone reduces the acidity in the soil. The soil was incredibly acidic because of all the acid rain, but that crushed limestone reduces the acidity, which allows plants to begin to grow. The next step is to add fertilizer. The same fertilizer that you might put in your garden to help plants grow. Fertilizer is plant food. It contains the essential nutrients that plants need to grow, and Sudbury soils were missing a lot of these because they'd washed away. After that, we can start planting. But the first thing we plant is grass. They are planted before trees for a few reasons. First thing is that they grow very fast, way faster than trees. And while they're growing, they put all their roots into the soil and they hold the soil in place. Grass prevents further erosion, holds on to the little soil that we had left, and the grass also helps build a new, healthier soil. It does that because every year when the stems of the grass die, they break down, they decompose just like compost does, and they make a healthier, richer soil for the next generation of plants to grow in. After all that, we can start planting trees. Here in Sudbury, we really started this massive regreening project in 1978. There have been many thousands of people here in Sudbury who have gone out to use this recipe to build a whole new forest on what was little but bare rock. To recap, step one is spreading limestone to reduce acidity. This is what the limestone actually looks like. It gets shoveled into these little bags and is then generally spread by hand. That there is actually someone flinging the crushed limestone out of the bag to spread it. Step number two is to apply fertilizer. This is also spread by hand, just like this, and it adds nutrients back into the soil to feed the plants. Step number three is planting grasses. They hold the soil in place to prevent erosion, and they build more soil when they decompose. And step number four is tree planting. Generally, we use tiny little seedlings just like this. 
Sometimes it's tricky to find enough soil to plant them, but it ends up working out really well. 30 years or so after they've been planted, those tiny little tree seedlings today make up the new forest of Sudbury. For a better idea of their size today, here's a cross section of a trunk from one of the first groups of trees planted. Quite the transformation from a tiny little tree seedling, eh? Did you know that you can actually guess the age of a tree by taking a closer look at a section like this? You do that by counting the rings. The amount of rings you count corresponds to the approximate age of the tree. See if you can count the rings. Fun fact, a cross section of a tree like this is actually called a tree cookie. Now it's time for the really cool part. Let's take a look at just how much Sudbury has changed since all this started. Here's a picture taken in Greater Sudbury's West End in the 1970s. Imagine if this was your backyard. Here's the same spot today. All those trees were planted one at a time by hand. Personally, I find it pretty difficult to recognize that that is the same street. This picture was taken close by Greater Sudbury's downtown core before regreening started. Really looking here like it was living up to that moonscape nickname. Sort of had the look of a rocky desert. Standing here today, this is what you see. Almost unrecognizable. Imagine this place given another 30 years of growing. In the early 1980s, this view from a hilltop in the town of Coniston within the city of Greater Sudbury wasn't exactly the stuff of postcards. But that was then. Today, the same spot, the same hilltop view looks like this. What I love most about this picture, other than the fact that it looks gorgeous, is that you can see green hills in the background, hills that have also been planted. Imagine how many trees it takes to re-green an area this big. Thousands of very determined people can plant a lot of trees in four decades. Since 1978 here in Sudbury, through the Municipal Regreening Program, we have actually planted 10 million trees. Now that sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, but to give you an idea of the scale of that, if you were to plant 10 million trees in a perfectly straight line, about a meter between each tree, that line of trees is actually enough to stretch from one side of Canada to the other side of Canada twice. That's how many trees have been planted here in Sudbury. At this point, you might be thinking, wow, 10 million trees, that's a lot of trees to regreen a whole city. But the thing is, we're actually not done regreening yet. To date, about half the area has been regreened, which means that there are lots of places in the city of Greater Sudbury that still look like this today. Barren areas where we have never spread lime or planted a tree. These are areas that still need our help if we want to see a forest any time there within the next few hundred years. Our goal in the city of Greater Sudbury is to plant a forest, a forest that's healthy, that's a good habitat, that's sustainable. However, forests are complicated ecosystems. They're made up of a whole host of species. And that means that to build a forest, we have to do more than just plant trees. In the next video in the series, we're going to take a more in-depth look at how to plant a forest.